Okay, so chapter six is about long-term memory and how it's structured. So long-term memory is the biggest capacity of our memory system. It, it's an archive of all of the information and past experiences and past knowledge we've had. Long-term memory is necessary for your working memory to function the way it should. It is the storage center that stretches from a few moments um, to many years ago. And we tend to remember most of our recent memories in much more detail than, th than things that happened a long time ago. Within long-term memory is the idea of serial position. So there was a researcher named Murdoch who in 1962 wanted to look at, okay, how do we remember lists of information? So what Murdoch discovered is that when people are presented with a list of things, it follows the serial position effect. And that is the effect that says that we tend to remember things more that are presented to us first or last in a list. Within the serial position effect is this idea of primacy and recency effect. So the primacy effect says that we're going to remember the things that are presented first in the list because we have more time to rehearse the information and it's there longer. It's the first thing we encounter. So it's going to get to long term memory. The recency effect <clears throat> is the information that's presented to us last. And although it doesn't get to our long-term memory, it stays in short-term memory, and that's why we're able to recall it. We have visual and auditory encoding in both our short and long-term memory. We also have semantic encoding in both short and long-term memory. And anytime we have any type of interference, that can help enhance our understanding of information that's presented to us visual, visually or auditorily. So when it comes to coding information in our long-term memory storage, um, we can have recognition memory, which is way, where we're able to identify things that we previously encountered. We can recognize it, like we can pick out the right answer from a list of answer choices. We also have our visual, auditory, and semantic memories and different ways it can play a role in our short-term and long-term memory. So you can take a look at that chart and this chart is also in your textbook to kind of show you the difference. For example, in auditory memory, representing the sounds of letters in the mind just after hearing them is a short-term memory function, whereas repeating a song that you've heard many times before over and over in your mind that is in your long-term memory. So there are a few patients who we've studied, researchers have studied to determine how long-term memory works. HM um, had his hippocampus removed and the hippocampus of course is responsible, the part of the brain responsible for our storage of memories. And through that store, through that study of HM, we are able to understand that information can be retained in short-term memory, but not able to transfer to long-term memory. And, you know, I always think of, you know, Dory, when I think of short-term memory issues that don't transfer to long-term memory. And then also the patient KF, which are both discussed in the textbook, um, this patient had access um, an accident in their parietal lobe. We know that the parietal lobe has some functions in memory as well. And although KF had impaired short-term memory um, loss, this patient had a functional long-term memory. So things weren't able to stay for the short, short term, but he was able to form and hold new memories. Within our long-term memory is also the idea of episodic and semantic memories. Episodic memories are your memories for personal experiences, what I call like episodes in your own personal life. 
Like for example, your graduation day. That is an, a memory, a, a personal experience that most people will recall. Or the day you got married or you know the, the birth of your first child. These are all things that involve mental time travel and when you remember it, you're able to relive it. So it's episodic memories, the episodes of your life. Whereas our semantic memory is our memory for general knowledge and facts. So there's no time travel involved. You just know, you know, math or, you know, state capitals and things like that. Those are all parts of your semantic memory. So if we think back to the patient KC with his damaged hippocampus, he was not able to recall those episodes from his life. He couldn't relive the past events, but he could still give factual information. So his semantic memory remained intact, but his episodic memories were impaired. There was also an Italian woman who was a patient that's talked about in your textbook as well. Her semantic memories, her factual knowledge was impaired, but she could still remember those specific episodes of her life. So these two parts of our memory system are separate entities. We've also done some brain imaging scans that have shown us um, from these functional MRIs that different areas of the brain are activated when a person experiences an episodic memory and a semantic memory. For example, if you look at the chart, the yellow area represents where those episodic memories are housed in the brain, whereas the blue areas are the areas associated with semantic memories. So they're not really even that close to each other. In addition, your episodic memories can be lost, um, which only leave your semantic memories, those factual um, memories that, that might be all you are able to recall. And semantic memories can be enhanced if associated with an episodic memory. So sometimes if people remember those episodes, perhaps they will also remember facts associated with it. Within that, we have to talk about autobiographical memory and personal semantic memories. So autobiographical memories are specific experiences that can include both semantic and episodic things. And then personal and personal semantic memories are gonna be those factual memories that also have personal experience. So anytime we can combine these two things, the um, episodic memories with actual facts, that helps enhance the memory. And so this chart gives you a little more detail about episodic, semantic, and autobiographical memories. Time can also impact our ability to remember. It can affect whether or not we forget something. So forgetting is going to increase with longer intervals after encoding. So if that information is not automatically transferred to long-term memory, chances are you're going to forget. A constructive episodic stimulation hypothesis is the idea that our episodic memories are extracted and recombined to create stimulations of future events. That helps us to anticipate our future needs and guide future behaviors. This adaptation also functions very similarly to mind wandering. This sort of constructive, these created episodes, um, this hypothesis that sometimes people can kind of construct their episodic memories. This chart also shows you the difference. I'm sure you remember this from general psychology the different uh, parts of the long-term memory structure. So you've got your explicit and implicit memories. Those explicit memories are gonna be things you have to think about to remember those episodic and semantic memories. Whereas your implicit memories are going to be things that you don't really consciously think about. They're kind of automatic, like procedures and priming and conditioning. So your implicit memories are going to be things that you learn from experience 
but you actually don't think about. So let's talk about the difference between procedural memories, priming, and conditioning. So your procedural memories are going to be memories for skills and actions, things that you know, but you don't really recall how you learned it. These are the procedures we perform without thinking about it. For example, when you get up and you walk, you don't think about how to walk, you just do it. Or when you drive your car, once you've learned how to drive the car, you no longer think about what to do, everything becomes automatic. So those people who cannot form new long-term memories, um, they're able to still learn new skills or new procedures like HM. Priming occurs when we are presented with a priming stimulus and that changes a person's response to another stimulus. You can have rep repetition priming, which is where you test the stimulus the same or in a similar way. And um, the person may or may not remember the original presentation of the stimulus. So when we are primed to do something, we are presented with a stimulus and we know how to respond to it, but we probably don't remember learning that. It's again, just automatic. So there's the propaganda effect, which says that we're more likely to rate statements read or heard before as being true. So when we read it, we hear it, that is put into our, our memory as something that is factual, whether it is or not. And then lastly, when it comes to classical conditioning, um, this is when we pair a neutral stimulus with a conditioned stimulus to eventually create a conditioned response. This involves your implicit memories because a person often forgets what the initial pairing was. So if we think back to the little Albert experiment in general psychology, we know that Albert was conditioned to be afraid of a white rat and later also became afraid of other things that look similar to that. Hopefully this helps you understand a little bit more about the complexities of long-term memory.